Welcome to the President and CEO Focus on the Middle Market podcast series, where President and CEO founder Paul Stuckel discusses middle market issues with business leaders from across the nation. Today, he speaks with Michael Bruno, founder of First Dibs, the premier online luxury marketplace, about the luxury space, working with venture capitalists, and why the heck he left Paris for New York. I lived in London for several years and have been in Paris a million times. It's my favorite city on the planet. So I have to start out, why in heaven's name did you leave Paris to go to New York? <laughs> well, actually, the story starts a little earlier. I left San Francisco to go to Paris, and that was during the... Um, I thought it was 1999, 2000 when I made the decision to go. Pretty much at the at the top, of the you know the initial dot com boom. Yeah. And um, I wanted to. I was determined to get into the internet space. And um, for me, leaving San Francisco and moving to Paris was going to make it possible for me to start an internet business. In my mind, everyone else thought I was crazy. <laughs> well, yeah, it does seem counterintuitive. <laughs> yeah, I moved to San Francisco in 1999 to prepare us to start an internet business. <laughs> right. But uh, that was, I, I was in the real estate business there, and, um, you know, I, I'm still a real estate junkie. I love real estate. And if you're good at real estate, it's hard to give it up. And, right. um, you know, you always have a client or friend or somebody who wants to buy or sell, so the temptation is too high because the money is. Is, is pretty rewarding, and um, so I thought, well, if I really want to do the internet business, and um, you know, and I wasn't a hundred percent sure exactly what I wanted to do, but I had, a, I knew it was related to the design interior space. I thought, let's just move for a little while and, and see if you can figure it out and get away from, you know, what gets you out of bed every day and to the office and, and try to find a new set of things to get out of bed for. So I chose to move to Paris, and literally the first. Like the first week I was there, the third day I went to the Paris flea market, and um, I realized right then and there that that's where I was going to start to to bring that to Americans online, so they could shop the Paris flea market. You know, pretty much every week it's kind of a weekly market there, right? Everything shows mm-hmm. up. It's open um, Friday through Monday, and it's closed the rest of the week, so dealers can go find new stuff and bring it. Yep. And so we we spent our our several days a week just going to the market, cataloging it and, and putting it online and making it available. In many ways, we were the original flash sale site, even though that's not what we are today because when we started, we'd go and we'd catalog about 100 pieces and put them online every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern time mm. and and just trained our buyers to show up once a week at, at 11 to see our, our latest finds. And, you know, half to three quarters of them would sell out in a couple hours. And then we'd wow. go back to the market and do it again. Sure. And um, so, so that was sort of the initial, um, you know, first dibs, you know, was at the Paris flea market and it was all online. And then after living there for about three years, I um, sort of had a, just decided that I wanted to take the business to more of a, um, it was really more, I, I started to lean more toward replicating sort of what we used in the real estate business, an MLS service, multiple listing mm-hmm. type service. Yeah, that yeah. was so effective for real estate brokers to find product and homes to sell to their clients. And I learned that the design trade worked very much the same way. They they often worked on a commission um, structure where what their clients bought, they got a percentage of. So I realized they, that's a professional industry. They needed that same set of tools for their business. Right. So we decided that, you know, I said that was going to be the, really the next phase of first dibs was not just being this shop at Paris flea market. It was, you now you can shop the Hamptons, New York City, San Francisco, Los Angeles. What are you looking for? Chandeliers. Do you want to go see it? Do you want to just buy it online? Right. And so it became very focused on just making sure we had every market that we thought mattered and, and covered very well with the best dealers in each of those markets. Right. In terms of, of the, you mentioned the MLS model, um, and I, I, I'm kind of ashamed to say I'm not quite sure how that works, but it, it, one of the things in, in my experience uh, in, in doing something similar to, to what you're doing, except on, the, on, a, on a more sort of logistic side, is that I mean, to a certain extent you're disintermediating folks, you're, and, and the, the dealers of the world um, I, I, I wonder how receptive they've been. Presumably, they've been very, quite receptive because you've been very successful. Um, but in, in, you know, obviously, as you say, they, they tend to work on a, on a commission type basis. 
Well, that would be um, the designer who's the buyer. And, and yeah. you're right, they, they, could, they could feel in the process that, you know, their clients don't need them because now they can go to this website and find all this stuff themselves. But right, the good right. designers know that there's no truth to that. It's it's not just finding the stuff. It's it's how, how do things fit together, proportion, color, design, style. And most consumers who, you know, attempt to do it on their own often find their, um, you know, if they've ever worked with a designer, they figure out really quickly how hard it actually is to get it right. And I know that right. firsthand. You know? Right. Because I've yeah, been well, working sure. without. And I know it's way better to do it with help. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, so your customers, your clients uh, would be working with a designer in going they to your could. sites and, could, and, and exploring these things. Yeah, I mean, they collaborate together looking at things like designers. You know, clients will often propose, like, well, what about this for the dining room? And, and the designer will say, well, it's not quite right, or it could be the other way around. But many designers tell us that we've helped them really grow their business because they're able to find a much better selection for their clients and, and create a much better aesthetic because it used to be they would either have to go on long trips to shop or they'd just go to the few shops near their home. Yeah, now they yeah. can go on our website and say, well, we're looking for a pair of chandeliers. We want them to be 19th century in style, at least, if not 19th century. And, um, you know, and, and we want it to be bronze. And bam, you know, if there's anything available, it's going to be on our website, you know. So um, it's it's enhanced their ability to get stuff done faster. The product on our website is, all, is almost all ready available stock, which is mm-hmm. a really important thing because there's no waiting to have it made or, or right. waiting for the manufacturer to produce it. It's just like, there it is. How quickly can you get it shipped? Mm-hmm. So no. most designers have found that our service has actually really enhanced their business, which is the opposite of what you might think. Um, and then um, the dealers, they've, they've, their business has grown dramatically because of the additional marketing push that they're getting from us as a company. Of course. So yeah. there, there, are, there aren't really any losers in this process so far. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I guess the the pertinent question from a business perspective is, how do you make your money? I mean, are you do you take commission? Do you take um, we, yeah, uh, is it long, a fee we, to be involved in this? I mean, I'm not sure how that yeah, works. Yeah, what we have is a um, a subscription based service has been you know the focus of the business for the last probably nine years. Prior to that, it was 100% commission-based service all online that you had to buy it online. I see. And then we made it a little easier where people could go to the store, contact the dealer directly, or buy it online. And so we always had a mix of commission and subscription. And, um, you know, we're in the middle of sort of um, restructuring that right now. We don't have the final structure of how that's going to work, but Right. We're we're switching the process to where it's very you know our, our whole goal is to make it easier and and no additional cost for buyers to buy it online, right? Just to just to drive the business where people want it, which is in an easy, easy comfortable way to to find it and buy it and be assured that they bought something that's correct and someone standing behind it. Yeah, well, and you know, and I guess that's probably one of the the biggest uh, stumbling blocks you had to overcome, which is, you know, obviously we're talking about high ticket items here. Um, and and building sort of a, a trust level amongst the the buyers who I imagine are not uh, didn't fall off the turnip truck as the saying goes, um, it, you know these are probably pretty these are pretty sophisticated folks. Building that level of trust must have been something of a challenge. I mean, how did you do that? Well, it, it wasn't really. I think it was less of a challenge and more of just something that built. You can only build trust over time. Yeah. And so over time. We stood behind, you know, buyers and sellers when problems happened and, and acted to help those problems be resolved because you're always going to have problems. And um, so we, we've never had to ask a dealer to leave the site for not managing a problem. Um, but, you know, problems have come up where dealers have made mistakes and, um, you know, we expect them to, to make good on it. And, um, you know, that's that's our job and, and sort of in a way we maintain um, – a pool of people's reputations, right? So yeah, if sure. if they want to be on the site, they have to be doing business in a ethical, professional way. Yeah. And um, you know, it's it is a site for professionals, so you don't have the same situation where it's a consumer selling an item directly yeah. to another consumer. Yeah, right. It's on an eBay. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, so that that on its own reduces problems, right? Sure. 
Sure. Just the fact that it's professional sellers. Well, and, and the 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 language you've used here for, um, and again, maybe it's because I'm ignorant of this of this world. Well, I, I certainly am ignorant of this world, but um, the language you've been using has been, you know, uh, designers and 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 that sort of thing, which at the very least suggests to me um, that we're talking about uh, interior design and, and and things of that nature. It it, it appears to me from the siding way you've got a much broader uh, sort of opportunity than that in terms of, of jewelry and fashion and, and oh, yeah, now no, real, a, real estate, obviously. We um, have a pretty which, extensive consumer base who who yeah. shop the site regularly. I mean, the 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 designers, you know, were our original customer, and the site was originally closed to um, the public and was only open to the trade. Right. Um, but then we opened it, I don't know, eight years ago to the public, and um, you know, they're they're a big part of the business for our customers, for our dealer customers, and growing every day, that part of the yeah. business. What role does the physical world play in, 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 in your, your overall model? We have one physical location, which is in New York. It's a 35,000 square foot full floor of a building at 200 Lexington, the New York Design Center. Okay. And that's open, that, that space is open to the public and to the trade. Um, there's about 70 different dealers there. We we did that as an experiment to see what what did it feel like as a company to, to have a physical space. How do we use it? How do our customers interact with it? Um, our dealers have to put their inventory somewhere anyway, so yeah. they're either putting it in a showroom or they're putting it in storage. So we made a really interesting deal with the people on the building to where it was very reasonable for dealers to have spaces there and to um, – let the building manage sort of selling the products and taking a commission to, to help offset their costs of operating the space. And it, it when we first launched it, we had um, double the number of dealers that than we needed that required that requested to have, be be there. So while we have one full floor, we could have taken two, and, and sure. we just kept it as one floor. And it's been really interesting. It's 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 dealers have asked us and and other landlords have asked us to do the same thing in pretty much every major market in the country and um, we may or we may not we haven't decided yet it's been about two years and it's been very successful we've never had a vacancy of this of space from dealers so every inch of the square footage has been leased the whole time in terms of of you know your growth path I mean what obviously you're you're putting on new things from from where you started I mean in, in terms of and I see you actually did succumb to go back to real estate Michael so Obviously, that temptation yeah. has uh, has overcome you again, but <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> well, the real estate and and design go so hand in hand. I mean, people who are selling their homes are often looking to buy things for their next home, or they may be looking to sell things that they currently have, which you know can benefit our existing dealers. Designers who are on our website on a regular basis are also always looking for new projects for their clients, new houses their clients can buy. So the fit is just was so right for us that sure. it's a little bit out of the loop of what we normally do because all the other products available, you can just buy it online. Obviously, the house is, is the one section you can't. Yep. But it just has such a nice overlapping you know flow with everything else we're doing. But as far as growth, I mean, at the moment, the, the thing that you know we're really focusing on is um, you know the additional markets. Like where else? Where else should we be? In the last six weeks, we added um, Italy and Spain. Um, prior to that, earlier in the year, last year we launched um, the Netherlands and Belgium, and um, we'll we'll be adding this year Germany, Austria, and Vienna, and then probably Scandinavia. So that's that's sort of our focus for this year. And our goal is just with each of those markets is to keep building up the network of dealers, building up the buyer base, and then begin the process of localizing the site into certain markets so we can become more of a local um, shopping experience for people in Germany or people in Italy. So sure. as, as we build those dealer networks, then the next step is to figure out how, you know, which markets do we localize first. So, so how do you market that? I mean, what's, what's, I mean what is your main uh, source of marketing in terms of getting the buyers to know that you're there? Well, you know, it's sort of one of the magic factors of a of a marketplace. If you have the inventory, the buyers will come. 
Um, it just it works that way because it, people find it, but you know we don't rely on that as our as our sole source of um, finding it. <laughs> but it's your CMO is going to be pretty one. bored if that's the case. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, he would believe me if if I would stick to that, he'd be very happy. The problem is I, I, don't, I won't I won't just rely on that. Um, we're very involved in a lot of the most important antique and art fairs around the planet. Maastricht okay. is it the TFAP show. We're a big sponsor of going on our third year. Um, they do the Pad London, Pad Paris shows, which we're involved in as a sponsor, the Winter Antique Show New York, San Francisco Paul Antique Show, LA. So all, all these major shows around the planet, we, we're a sponsor because it's very targeted. People who are going to those shows obviously have an interest in that type of product, so it might be the first time they hear of us or the third time. So by then, they, they really the confidence level begins to build as part of the trust building. We yeah. also do a lot of advertising and print. Um, we're an unusual online company. Or, or we advertise in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, and also we still advertise in magazines. Sure. Um, we like those mediums. Um, you know, this so do year, we, Michael. So do we. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we believe in it, you know. So, yeah. um, and it's, it's worked really well for us. Of course, you know, we have a lot of new people at the company that have joined in the last year who come from a, a background of – of um, you know uh, a web, a pure web experience, and their sure. their job is to help us determine how we take the long tail of product that's on our website and and market it through the more you know what you could call traditional web channels, which we've never done. So there's a massive opportunity for us as a company to expand our marketing in in sort of these um, you know these what are not considered new anymore, but internet ways that we've yeah, never yeah. leveraged. Interesting. So how is it how is it um dealing with the uh, venture capital guys? I have some experience in that and <laughs> that can be a great experience or a hard awesome experience. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> we're both. pretty new on that path, right? We're pretty yeah. new on that path. So <laughs> at the moment, you know, it's it's a very nice rosy situation and we did hand select the people that did invest because we wanted to have people that um that have the right backgrounds, could bring things to the table, and we also felt really comfortable with. And um, we just had a board meeting last week, and I walked out of there so happy because there were two of the new board members who had recently invested that I thought, I could not have sold everyone else in this room on their points better. You know, it's, right. they, we, were, we were so in alignment. It's like, geez, how, the, how did that work out so brilliantly? Yeah, that's wonderful, and, yeah. Um, yeah, so so it's it's really – it's a really fun experience for me because, you know, for 10 years, the company was completely owned, you know, outright, no debt, no investors. Um, and then I finally decided to do this about a year ago with Benchmark Capital first. And then yep. we added Spark and Index as, as uh, investors recently. And, um, you know, the the involvement of Matt Kohler from, from Benchmark um, was amazing because he – he brought forward someone he thought would be a great candidate to run the company, David Rosenblatt. And, and he said, if we could ever get this guy, we'd be so lucky. And I said, yeah, why is he going to want to come work here? You know? Yeah, right, David's, right, right. David's a real New Yorker. I mean, he loves New York, so he's yeah. not leaving New York. And I think the idea of being involved in something so different than what he'd done before was what was compelling to him. And, and in this whole new space of luxury that had never really um, sure. made it as an online true entity. Yeah, having those yeah. experts involved, it, for me, it's sometimes we're in meetings and I'm thinking, is this the company I started? We're all talking about, you know, <laughs> just because as, as, as we watch it progress and how they apply all these layers of knowledge that they all have yep. from different areas and how they all come together to to really take something and actually take the vision I had all along and make it be real. Yeah, I know mean, that. It was always that's exciting. It was always my goal to be a global company, but to to just have a network of dealers where people can buy from, that's fine. But to have a, a a network that creates a luxury, safe, secure buying experience for buyers anywhere on the planet who can click a button and buy it and have it sent and know everything's okay or if there's a problem, have it resolved and you know all those things. Putting all that in place is a massive undertaking and it yeah, requires sure it a lot of experience. Um, well, Michael. So, what's what's next? I mean, you're you're expanding you're expanding globally, obviously, in terms of the the, the dealer marketplaces. And you're you're it sounds like you're going you're using a um, a localized strategy on top of the sort of the the global strategy, right? In terms of of creating local networks. And what's after That's that? That's right. 
Well, I mean, we're or, or is we're, that an, um, <laughs> the moment? Well, you know, I mean, if we add enough, if we add all the markets in Europe that matter, add that to the U.S., you know, the North America and a little bit of South America and um, Europe, then there's certain other markets on the planet, Asia, um, you know, Brazil, various places that are really well positioned just to be people who are buyers. Yeah, so sure. We have to look to see how do we position you know, our product offering to those, you know, to those massive markets that yeah. have not, they don't have access to the supply of type of product we have. It's just, you know, it's well, you know, it, it occurs there. to me, I, I hadn't really thought about this, but I'm a, a partner in a company that's based in Dubai. And, um, boy, I mean, because Dubai is, has sort of, I, I don't know how familiar you are with that part of the world, but I mean, it's yeah. sort of become the Hong Kong of, of, sure. of the Middle East, right? That's Middle East. the shopping yeah. Mecca. And obviously, there's a lot of dough there, um, to be <laughs> to use the vernacular. Yeah, exactly. Uh, um, I mean, you, have you guys thought about that part of the world, or is that not yet a, we actually, an attractive you know, no, spot yet? I mean, we're. I think we're thinking about every part of the world. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm <laughs> sure we are. Yeah. Doing, but are we doing anything about it? That's the question. And, and yeah. really, it's about maintaining a very, a very, you know, focused approach on everything that has to be done at the moment, which is really redesign our buyer experience, redesign a lot of the tools on the website. We just launched a new redeveloped site which has a lot better SEO for you know for English in America. Then sure. we have to take the other languages so we get the same benefit of SEO in other languages. Um, yep. Increase, uh, you know, and develop a much better set of buyer's tools and assurances for buyers. Work on how we consolidate shipping through around the planet with all of our with all of our dealers. Yep. So there's a lot of things to the core that are just right now really being strengthened as we add new markets, and that'll probably be over the next 18 months. And then from there, there'll be you know there'll be a lot of a really great foundation to do so many other things. And we're we're, we're given opportunities every single day of interesting um, joint ventures to do with companies that sure. sound interesting. And and you know we we keep saying, well, that sounds great, but, um, you know, we'll talk in six months kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, no, um, I know. Because that's one of David's great characteristics. He's wildly focused, and, and that's, a, that's a good thing because I, I get excited. I want to do everything. Be sure to check back at presidentandceomagazine.com for future episodes in the President and CEO Focus on the Middle Market podcast series. Thanks for listening.